You're listening to Shift, Human First Financial Guidance with Ross Marino. Today, we are shifting the conversation once again with Ed Combs. Hello, Ed. Hey, Ross. Great to be with you today. Always good to have you on the show. A lot of people may not know who you are. If you don't mind, why don't you just start by introducing yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I'm the founder of Healthy Love and Money. It's a fee-only financial planning practice based in Charlotte, North Carolina. We serve clients around the country. And what's unique and special about us is us, me, I'm both a licensed marriage and family therapist, as well as a certified financial planner. And I bring those two worlds together. I also have the great fortune of being this year's president of the Financial Therapy Association, which is an outstanding group of financial planners and mental health professionals looking at how do we bring these two diverse worlds together in a way that's helpful for more clients. Well, I'm looking forward to attending my first Financial Therapy Association conference next month. I'm going to drive over. I'm not far away from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And I know that we had some people from the Financial Therapy Association speak at Shift earlier this year. We also have you and some others who are going to be speaking next year at Shift. And specifically, our theme for Shift in 2024 is describing what to do and how to do it. How do you shift the conversation? What are some protocols? And the reason I love the Financial Therapy Association is you really get into the weeds of here's what you do and how here's how you're going to do it. So how about for today, we'll just take a quick case scenario, and then we'll talk about some of those protocols. So you have a great case scenario that you may have been working on with clients or may not, or it could be entirely made up. But either way, how about you start with a scenario? Yeah, so this one is is a conglomerate of probably a little bit of my own life and quite a number of other couples that I've worked with. But you, you take a, a pretty successful couple, one partner is maybe a more salaried, stable individual, and the other person's an entrepreneur. And yet their entrepreneurial venture is maybe not going quite so well. Maybe it's not cash flowing like it needs to. And there's a building resentment in the relationship about where to go with this. And so they're you know, stuck. What do we do? How do we, you know, nobody likes this feeling resentful or being resented kind of bit. What do we do? Yeah. And that is, uh, when you shared that with me, that that is common for so many different people. And and I, of course, joked, are you talking about you or me or is this hypothetical? <laughs> right? But it's because we all have that if we're in a marriage or a relationship where there is a stable and there is someone with an entrepreneurial venture, because entrepreneurial ventures are just messy. Uh, even, even when things are going well for someone who comes from a world of stability, it's really hard, I think, to understand if you've never been through that. Sounds like a great place to think about and apply therapeutic principles. So in this scenario, um, actually, before we go into what would you do, can you maybe just describe the mindset behind the stable person and the challenge that that brings into that relationship? Oh, that's a that's a great question. And I think there's probably a, num- a, a couple of possible different mindsets, but one lens that I look through is why is financial security and stability important to them right and part of why we ask that question is as a financial therapist we we know that people's family experiences around money profoundly shape them and what they they want out of their financial life is often in reaction to what they saw in their family growing up so in this particular case that i'm thinking about uh the person that is a stable earner um grew up in a family where her father was actually an entrepreneur surprise and uh let let me tell you just in very short he grew his practice and then got in some legal trouble and got bankrupted and got disbarred and so you can imagine the financial out uh fallout of that type of experience and for this client what did that leave her with but nothing but a desire for financial security stability and predictability yeah, and I would imagine that drives a lot of the people with stability type issues. It goes back to the money story, which is always a great topic. Uh, again, I can say I, I resemble that remark because I'm married to someone who loves the stability, who has a money story, not exactly like that, but similar enough that would drive her to say, I like stability. And I have to say, I'm sorry, you're married to an entrepreneur, which, by the way, was the worst thing I could possibly say decades ago to uh, to my wife. 
but that's part of it, right? You have to tap into the story. I know that that's part of the financial therapy world. So that's a great mindset to approach. Now, if you're in that scenario, let's let's talk about what and how. So what type of protocol would you use or how would you address that situation? Well, you know, I think it depends on the stage of working with the client, right? But if we're in an early stage of just getting to know this as a new client, maybe they're even a prospect client concerning, you know, should I be working with you or not? And because I think a lot of clients can come to a financial planner thinking, well, they're going to give me technical answers to help me solve this cash flow and projection problem. And we'll run some models and figure out where is this going to go and what does this mean? But where I start is more around listening and asking them the questions about their relational history with money. That is the first step is listening with empathy and what we therapy word we call unconditional positive regard, which basically means no judgment. Right. That is the first step. That is the tool that is sounds so simple for me to sit here with you, Ross, and say, well, yeah, you listen with empathy. And, you know, that it actually has profound impact on folks because a lot of times people have never actually been able to tell the fullness of their story without being interrupted. But when they start to tell their story more fully without being interrupted, what happens naturally and what I know from lots of experiences they then start to connect the dots for themselves about how their experiences are linked. And that's a profound experience to watch unfold for them. Yeah. And I'm, I'm taking notes of course, because this is so relevant and I really should be listening intently, but I can't help it because you're just, you're (laughs) dropping nuggets here that are are just relevant to what I do. And um, the part about not being interrupted, it's so challenging for advisors as we're listening, when we hear something that we know now we can actually address because there is some action item that pops up into our brain that says, oh, well, if that's the situation, here's what we're going to do. Let's go a little bit into the mind of the advisor. Why do you think it's so hard for the advisor to just sit there and not interrupt? Well, Ross, you may hate me for saying this, but I'm a therapist through and through. And so the advisor has a family money history as well. And they often play the role of financial rescuer or mediator in their family. And it makes them feel very uncomfortable to have somebody else in their office uncomfortable around money. Unconsciously, it's taking them back into their own discomfort that initially drew them into the field of financial planning. Now, let me unpack that for you just a little bit. I want to take you back to me going into grad school to be a therapist. Class one, day one. To the whole body of students sitting in the classroom, why are you here? Well, yeah, duh, it's obvious. I'm here to help people, right? My, I want to help people. Like, that's why I'm here. No, why do you want to be here? What do you need from the field of therapy? And that question I have noodled on for the last, uh, let's call it 12 years. Because What I know, we know about the field of therapy is people are drawn to it because they're trying to work something out for themselves and they need to figure that out for themselves so that that their stuff doesn't get projected onto their clients. That's the ideal. It's not a perfect process, but that's the, the big concept. My general working hypothesis is most people attracted to personal finance and financial planning have had pretty significant painful experiences around money in their life at some point. And they look to the field of finance to increase their financial security because there's a high income potential often. I mean, heck, that attracted me to the field initially. I was like, what do you mean? I can make a million dollars a year selling all this insurance? That sounds great. Uh, Well, folks, I never made anywhere close to that. I think I made no money selling insurance (laughs) because I won't sidebar onto that. But anyhow, the point is, right, I I wanted greater financial security. I wanted to know how the financial world actually worked. How did people actually become rich? Right, That was a question in my mind. And it's like, oh, these financial planners seem to really understand this world and help people do it. That sounds cool. right? But it was out of my own context of feeling like there was some financial strain. There was the natural financial limits of growing up in a blue collar family and what we could do or couldn't do that shaped me. And so right, wrong, or indifferent, I was drawn to the field because I like helping people and I wanted to better understand money. And I think a lot of advisors I've talked to have some constellation of that type of story, right? The variables might be different, but the the underlying emphasis is there. So coming back to this initial question is now I'm sitting there with my clients and it's 
oh, this feels like what mom and dad thought about. This is what mom and stepdad, stepdad and stepmom, you know, whatever that family constellation is, is we start to see those themes. And because psychologically, we're prone to make associations, especially self-centered associations, which as soon as we start making self-centered associations, we lose track on the, of the client and we make it about ourselves. So it's an, one of those skills is recognizing that you've gone to that place that you're making it about yourself and your experiences and then turn, returning your focus back to what is this client saying about their story and being curious about them. So, sorry, that was a, a mouthful. It was great because just the self-awareness alone is something you and I talked about a little bit before we started recording is as you learn some of the principles of therapy and you learn what people are thinking and how they're feeling, at least in my case, I'll think back literally decades because I just celebrated my 32nd anniversary for being married and thinking, I wish I knew that in year one or two because it's so valuable. And I think it's the same principle with financial planning that when we're sitting with people, we have to be aware of that. That's a wonderful perspective. It's an important nugget to take away. I know that'll be part of your session at Shift in 2024. I know there's going to be a lot more. I'm looking forward to it. Ed Combs, thanks for being on the show and we will see you in March in Orlando. Looking forward to it, Ross. Thank you for the opportunity as always. Thank you for listening to Shift with Ross Marino. Please visit humanfirst.live to learn more. This show is for general information purposes only and is not intended to provide recommendations or advice. Speak with a legal, tax, or financial advisor before making any decisions. Past performance references are historical and do not guarantee future results.